Hello lovelies and welcome to another video. Today I'm finally going to talk about my beloved old Hollywood films. I think there's something absolutely special about films from the past and they are the ones that I personally like to watch the most. So I want to make a little series out of this where I pick out different genres and different decades. And I want to start off with my favorite rom-coms from the 19. 50s. These are the 10 that I picked out and I would say let's go. <laughs> so the first three movies are with one of my absolute favorite actresses of all time, the one and only Audrey Hepburn who was one of the actresses of the 1950s and obviously I have to include her in this list. <laughs> so the first one is Roman Holiday, which came out in 1953. This is one of my absolute favorite films of all time. I've seen it so many times. <sighs> it's just so sweet. That was Audrey Hepburn's first major role and it was also the role that won her the Oscar in 1954. She plays alongside Gregory Peck and Eddie Albert the role of Princess Anne, who is a princess of a fictional kingdom. And she is traveling around Europe and her last stop is in Rome. She rebels against her royal obligations and decides to explore Rome all by herself. And that's where she meets Gregory Peck's character, who is a newspaper man seeking for an exclusive story and so they end up exploring Rome together. But yeah, I think that's already enough said. You definitely have to watch this film yourself. It is an absolutely sweet storyline, very enjoyable with some great actors and big plus point, you get to see the loveliest sides of Rome because it was completely filmed in Rome, Italy and for me, as someone who absolutely loves this city, it's just fantastic. Luckily they filmed it in Rome because at first they wanted to completely film it in Hollywood studios, which was pretty common back in the days, but William Wyler, who was the director of the film, insisted to film it in Rome. Fortunately they did it because otherwise I don't know how it would have turned out. Then, of course, Audrey Hepburn's second big film in Hollywood, Sabrina, which came out in 1954. In this film, she plays alongside two big actors from that time, William Holden, the Golden Boy, and Humphrey Bogart, which a lot of you probably know from the film Casablanca. <laughs> this film is kind of a Cinderella story in a way, like a modern Cinderella story. You have the two brothers, Linus and David Larrabee. One of them is the businessman and the other one is kind of the playboy. They both live on Long Island and are from a rich family. Then you have Audrey's character, Sabrina Fairchild, who grew up with them but is the daughter of their chauffeur. And she one day travels to Paris, she comes back as a very elegant and fresh young lady and both brothers kind of get attracted to her charm. It's a very romantic and funny film, also still in black and white, even though in the 1950s it slowly changed into colored films, but this is still a classic black and white one. It's definitely one of the best films from the 1950s. It was even nominated for six Oscars, but for me the best thing of this film is Audrey Hepburn's wardrobe. It's just absolutely gorgeous. This was the first time that Audrey Hepburn worked together with Givenchy. As most of us probably know, both of them had a wonderful friendship. They worked together many, many times. Givenchy did a lot of her costumes, especially the black and white floral dress in this film is just... I absolutely adore it. Also, a little trivia effect. Humphrey Bogart was actually very unhappy while filming because he thought he was too old, but the film still became a success. So the last Audrey Hepburn film that I want to include in this list is Funny Face from 1957. 
This is also one of the films where Audrey can finally dance and sing, which she was very, very happy about. Because before she became an actress, she always wanted to be a dancer, but she couldn't follow this as a career. So she dances and sings as the librarian, Joe Stockton, from Greenwich Village, alongside Fred Astaire, who is playing a fashion photographer, and Kay Thompson, who is also working for a fashion magazine. And with the help of those two, she turns from the so-called grey mouse into an elegant and charming fashion model. They travel from America to Paris to shoot a fashion campaign with her. With the fact that it is filmed in Paris, it gives us amazing insights into that city with all its beautiful places. And of course, since this film is about fashion, we also get to see some amazing outfits designed again by Givenchy himself. And again, he did an amazing job. As I said, they shoot a fashion campaign. So they take photos in the film and the photos are actually taken by Richard Everden, who was one of the most famous photographers of that time. Also one of my favorite photographers. The character played by Fred Astaire was actually based on Richard Everden. Also, fun fact, to secure Audrey Hepburn and Fred Astaire on the cast, the directors actually told each the other was already signed, figuring they would not pass the opportunity to play in this film together. And it actually worked out, luckily. <laughs> but yeah, funny face, a funny film, lovely cast, lovely songs, lovely dresses, lovely Paris. But there's also another favorite leading lady of mine, Grace Kelly. And she starred alongside Frank Sinatra and Bing Crosby in High Society from 1900. 56. So this film is actually kind of a modern musical remake of the original film, The Philadelphia Story, from the 1940s with Cary Grant, Katherine Hepburn and Jimmy Stewart. Highly recommend you to check that out as well, but it is in the 1940s so that's why it is not in this list. Bing Crosby who is singing My Beloved Frank Sinatra. There's also Louis Armstrong who is playing a cameo role in the film. And Grace is also singing. They actually wanted to dub her at first, but they didn't do it in the end. And the song, True Love, which he sang with Bing Crosby, actually became a gold record. Not bad. There is C.K. Dexter Haven. What a name. Played by Bing Crosby. He is a famous jazz singer who lives close to his ex-wife. Tracy Lord, played by Grace Kelly. And Grace's character actually wants to marry again, but Bing's character is still in love with her, so he tries to get her back. And then there's also Mike Connor, who is Frank Sinatra's character, and he is an undercover reporter who also falls in love with Tracy while he is covering a story for Spy magazine. It's definitely an entertaining story to watch with a beautiful Grace Kelly. Her wardrobe in this film is also very inspiring, which I think most of you realize is very important for me, of course. Fun fact, Elizabeth Taylor was actually considered for the role of Tracy but she was not available, so the role went to Grace Kelly. I'm really happy that Grace got the role for this part. It was also her last film before she retired from acting and went to Monaco. Now let's come to one of the most famous blonde actresses of the 1950s, Marilyn Monroe, and of course there can't be a list without her because she made a lot of films during that one decade and especially quite a few rom-coms. I think one of her most famous one is, of course, The Seven Year Itch. We all know that very famous dress scene. And if you don't know it, I don't know what is wrong with you. <laughs> but I'm actually not going to include this film in my list because there are two films that I personally like more. And one of them is Gentlemen Prefer Blondes. Again, this is also kind of a musical comedy rom-com that was just very common back in the 1950s. So there are a lot of rom-coms who were also 
musicals. This is also one of Marilyn's most famous films, especially the scene where she's wearing the iconic pink dress, standing in the middle of a man crowd and she's singing Diamonds are girl's best friend. I actually read that Marilyn was supposed to wear nothing but bands of black velvet and loads of rhinestones to create the illusion of a woman-sized necklace. Very interesting idea, but they obviously didn't end up doing it because they thought it was too revealing. Of course, Marilyn is not the only star of the movie since she plays alongside Jane Russell, who's playing her brunette friend. They're both showgirls who are on their way to Paris on an ocean liner. And on their way to Paris, they are enjoying the company of other men, of course. And Marilyn's character actually has a fiancé. Was that the right pronunciation? I hope so. But his father thinks that she is only after his money, that she only wants to marry a rich man. He actually hires a private detective to have an eye on her. And what's also great to know is that the film was actually based on a musical that played on Broadway. And the first version played in 1928. And then it also ran again in 1949. And the film obviously was a success as well. It's a funny rom-com with lots of dancing, singing, lovely costumes very 1950s. Moving on with another very famous Marilyn movie where she stars alongside Lauren Bacall and Betty Crable in How to Marry a Millionaire, which also came out in 1953. So this film is about three very different women, but they're all models in New York. They all live together in a very exclusive apartment, but they don't have a lot of money. And they're tired of cheap men, so they come up with a plan. They try to use their talents to get themselves some millionaires, which I think makes sense with the title of the film. But of course, as it is most of the time, it turns out a little bit differently and they kind of realize that there is something a little bit more important in life. Since they play models in New York, you get to see, again, wonderful fashion, as always. And there's actually a scene where they are modeling garments in kind of a showroom, as it was very common back then. And Marilyn is actually modeling in a red swimsuit, and the description of that swimsuit is, you know, of course, diamonds are a girl's best friend. Obviously, that is a reference to our other film, Gentlemen Prefer Blondes, which came out the same year and we just talked about. And I love little details like that. There's also another scene where Lauren Bacall makes a reference to her husband, Humphrey Bogart, where she says something like, you know that old fella from The African Queen? I love that old guy. <laughs> And if you know Lauren Bacall and Humphrey Bogart, he was quite a few years older than her, so it's also a very funny reference. But yeah, it's a funny film with three absolutely amazing and beautiful actresses who are trying to find love. Another very famous Hollywood blonde actress and also one of my favorite singers of all time is Joris Day. And she stars in the next film on my list, which is Pillow Talk from 1959. So this is one of those films that I've seen so many times, I can't even remember how many times I've seen it, because it always makes me happy. Whenever I feel bad, I just have to watch that film and I feel immediately better again. So it's definitely a mood enhancer. And this is also Doris Day's and Rock Hudson's first out of three films together. So she stars alongside Rock Hudson in this rom-com and they are my absolute favorite on-screen couple. They have an amazing chemistry. I wish they made more films together. Doris Day plays the role of Jane, who is an interior designer, and Rock plays Brad, who is a composer, and they both share a phone line. But Rock's character is a big womanizer, and he's constantly talking to his girlfriends, and Jane, Doris Day's character, is absolutely annoyed by this, and she kind of ends up disliking him a 
little bit. But because they only know each other through the phone, they don't know how they look like. One day, Brad actually sees Jane in a restaurant and he realizes that she is a very charming, good-looking lady. So he decides to, well, kind of try it out with her. But since he knows that she doesn't like him as Brad, he just acts like he is someone else. And that's where it begins. What I've realized over the past years is that these kind of storylines where someone pretends to be someone else to get something are very, very, very common for 1950s films. But I personally don't mind it. I like these kind of stories and it's always fun to watch. And especially this one is definitely one of the best examples for that. <laughs> On that note, the film was nominated for five Oscars and actually won an Oscar for best screenplay and writing. Honestly guys, if you haven't seen this film, please give it a watch. If you have already seen it, then just watch it again because you can never watch it too often. Moving on to another film with the wonderful Doris Day but with another leading man, Clark Gable. Most of us know him from the classic Gone with the Wind but he's playing a completely different role in that film and it is Teacher's Pet from the year 1958. In this film Clark Gable plays the role of a hard-boiled editor of a newspaper and he believes that the only way to learn the business is by the way of the school of hard knocks. So he's not really pleased when his boss tells him to help a college professor with her journalism class and this professor is played by none other than Doris Day. Because he kind of feels a little bit attracted to Doris, he ends up pretending to be a student. This is also another good example of someone who is pretending to be someone else, <laughs> but it is a completely different storyline and it also has a very, very different feeling. By the way, before Clark Gable got the role, Cary Grant and James Stewart were actually considered for the role, but they thought they were too old for it. Gable was obviously also a little bit too old, especially since he was 21 years older than Doris. That was also the reason why they decided to make the film black and white, because they thought they could disguise Gable's age and weight. But yeah, I personally don't have a problem with it and it nonetheless is a great film to watch. Now I'm already coming to the last two films on my list and they are with none other than the classic old Hollywood leading man Cary Grant. And one of them is Indiscreet with the amazing Ingrid Bergman. They're actually playing alongside for the second time since they also starred together in the Hitchcock film Notorious, which is also a great one by the way. Ingrid Bergman is playing an actress who is living in London and she doesn't really have a lot of luck with men and love. She comes home earlier from a little trip and meets Cary Grant's character who is a Financier. Financier. Financier? What a weird word. A financier. Well, basically he is working in the finance world alongside her brother-in-law. And of course, as it is, they both feel a little bit attracted to each other, but it turns out that Carrie's character actually has a wife. It's a very sweet and light comedy. It's one of those films where it just you know, don't have to think about anything. You can just lay back, relax and enjoy. I also found out that this was actually Cary Grant's personal favorite film. And if you haven't seen it yet, but you love Cary Grant, then I think that's a good reason to watch it. <laughs> also, for all of my fashion friends, in this film, Ingrid Bergman actually wears some of Dior's last personal creations. They look fantastic. Last but not least, Cary Grant and my favorite Italian actress Sophia Loren in Houseboat from 1958. 
Just like with Bergman, this was also Carrie's and Sophia's second film together, since they also played alongside in the film The Pride and the Passion from 1957. Carrie is playing a widower who has three children and he doesn't really know how to do it because his wife, which passed away, always did everything and so he doesn't really know what to do with his children. But then there comes Sophia's character who helps him and becomes their nanny. There are a few different things happening which I don't want to tell you now but those things lead them to living in a houseboat and of course while living in this houseboat together they get to know each other a little bit better and um, yeah. I'm not 100% sure if this is true but I've read that Carrie actually only said yes to the role because he had a little bit of a relationship with Sophia and he was in love with her but she then married her husband Carlo Ponti and Carrie was heartbroken obviously and he didn't want to continue the film but he had to. A little bit sad for dear Carrie but that's life. It's still a lovely film. Really enjoy it and it's the last one of my list. So these were 10 rom-coms from the 1950s that I recommend you to check out. And for all of those wondering, as you may have seen, I have all of these films on DVD, so I have a big collection of old films and I usually get them on Amazon, but in general they're actually very easy to get on the internet. Obviously, since there are so, so, so many more rom-coms from the 1950s, I put a list into the description that you can check out for a few more films to watch, but definitely feel free to comment down below some of your favorite films. I would love to hear them. Also, since I want to make this a series, I was thinking about continuing with rom-coms from the 1960s, but definitely let me know if you have some more suggestions for different genres or different decades, or maybe I have a look at a specific director. Let me know. If you enjoyed this video, then definitely leave a like and subscribe to my channel. I wish you a wonderful rest of the day, and I will hopefully See you in one of my next videos. Bye! <laughs> did I... Did I wreck... Did I... <laughs> oh, oh god. Did I wreck us? Also, also, also... What the hell? Also, Audrey... Ab <laughs> I can't speak today. Oh my god. Which is why I don't include it in this list. And one of them is Gentleman. <laughs> Gentleman. Oh my god. Why? I'm already coming. <coughs> <coughs> Mann, was ist denn heute los?